In the middle of 2020, the Black Crown writhed and choked, then spat out ten pips one after the other. The blurry split-second pictures taken of all ten were combined and refined to build a true image. They were space amoebas, of the sort previously exterminated upon sight. The land of the space amoebas really was out there, beyond the gate. In fact, it became clear that Shusima had achieved her dream of finding it. These latest sightings rode their extreme momentum through the solar system, slowing themselves with their wide translucent fins as they approached their destination, Earth. Wonder twisted into terror as Chu's prophecy burst into reality. With a gleam of fluorescence, the amoebas gushed a thick phlegm towards the planet. These gelatinous chunks seemed to be ignited by the atmosphere, flaring up with a brilliant blue light. Then, a rain of blue fire fell upon the earth. When it hit the ground, be it mud, concrete or metal, the fire would melt anything it touched, and set the liquefied remains alight with further flames. In the virtual, people quickly noticed that sometimes others would disappear, or that the world would fail to load certain portions. An unlucky few had no time to check the terrestrial news for an explanation. The blue fire collapsed roofs and melted through VR enclosures, turning flesh into dripping piles of azure candles. It was the future Shu Suma had foreseen, brought to life in the present by whatever cause one cared to preach. Be it the wrath of the cosmos or not, it had been shown prior that amoebas were simply animals. No matter their master, these stellar assailants were material and mortal. Where was the newly refit SI Space Force now? Unfortunately, it was in Murphid, orbiting the great tombstone star of a crushed civilization. This location was chosen because it was relatively far from the prying eyes of the scaly Tuxcan Combine, and because the lay of the hyperlanes rendered it a threshold into the great unknowns of the galactic interior. However, it was the better part of a year's journey from Earth. It seemed the SI was in no position to save humanity. But the end was averted quickly, thanks to Xu Suma. Her expedition ship was being reassembled from the collected pieces outside the Seoul space station. Among the recovered cargo were chunks of amoeba flesh, pieces blasted off the assailants of the unknown victims on the other end of the gate. Despite being thousands of years old, when they were irradiated in the hopes of learning more about the attackers, they immediately regained their fluorescence and new cells pushed their way out through the old. More importantly, the amoebas spitballing Earth began to wave their fins and tack down the solar wind towards the Sol Station. Earth's execution was stayed, and instead, Sol Station was besieged. The amoebas circled it, launching out more of their incendiary bile, but in the vacuum it could not ignite. It was turned away by the force fields around the station, erected to replace the previous asteroid defense measures. This state of affairs simply carried on for months, but the energy needed to maintain the force field was great. It wasn't long before flecks of the hull started to fizzle into gas. Realizing they were going to be melted away before help arrived, the SI crew began fighting back. The station had mass drivers that could stick bits of torn up bulkhead right through the skin of the amoebas. And they were easy enough to hit each being roughly the size of a few national syndicates combined. Over the months, a few of the amoebas were punched into submission, fading and drifting away as gravity took them. But it was not enough for the station. In March 2221, the force field was fried and the hull was rapidly being transformed into a congealed mess of sloppy residue. This residue was not especially airtight. In a last bid move, the station was completely powered down, its residents sitting in the emergency lifeboats for oxygen. For a few days they endured hearing the colossal groans of the buckling station, praying to chance that the lifeboats would not feel the dripping of that hateful spit. Chance favoured them, and the amoebas turned back to Earth. The samples of amoeba flesh died off, and the stalkers outside lost interest. The siege came to an end, 
and it had been a victory. Several amoebas had been so filled with metal that they were functionally deceased, and enough time had been bought that the Murphid fleet had flashed down lane after lane back to Sol. Once they arrived, they made a beeline for the amoebas, who were just about to reach Earth. The amoebas seemed to pick up on the threat and turned to hurl more bile at the ships. The rescue fleet was immediately blasted by the astonishingly accurate spitting. Globs of acid could travel for days, then suddenly appear from the darkness and strike dead on, blistering hulls and scrambling sensors. Something of a battle was had, in which the SI ships coarsened the surface of the amoebas with high-energy lasers. That is, until the laser ports were too misshapen and crumbly to be used. It was not enough to stop the amoebas, and the SI ships had to flee to avoid total destruction. Here, Shu Suma saved the SI yet again. Her research had unveiled a way to activate hyperlane travel in conventional space, which effectively allowed the craft to zoom away from the battle. However, they zoomed without the guidance of a hyperlane, and would have to fly around with incredible speed until they found an entrance to one, leaving the embrace of the stars as they whizzed around at relativistic speeds. It would be a long time before these wrinkled ships would be seen again, but their intervention had been a success. The amoebas reacted to the scarring the ships had given them by travelling to Sol and simply basking in its energy. They were regenerating their bodies, but this process was not all that fast. Therefore, execution was stayed even further. The SI rushed to build a weapon that could destroy the amoebas, and reveled in the unrivaled attention the whole ordeal was getting from the humans. A genuine war of the worlds was all it took to get terrestrial involvement to triple. Or perhaps it was the evacuations and power outages from the blue fires, which still burned in some parts of the world. For the time being, they had either entered the eye of the storm, or the war was over. While all this had been going on, new discoveries had been flowing in from the distant cosmos. Yushin Ishikawa had compiled evidence of an extinct First League civilization known as the Kamdai. They had lived on the moon of Skat 3, a world covered in liquid water. So covered, in fact, that land was at a premium, leading to endless conflict in Kamdai history. This warrior culture had invaded the First League as soon as they had discovered the hyperlanes, but this venture failed, and they had then joined the League instead. Evidence for all this was scant, and archaeology on Skat 3A was nearly impossible, as the two million year old pieces of Kamdai cities were now long since weathered away and subsided into the ocean. Yet a metal artifact preserved in a vacuum case was recovered. It was a bladed melee weapon, which according to an inscription on the case, belonged to an esteemed First League Kamdai soldier. This brought further into question the sophistication of the First League, and counted as a win for the Optimist faction within the SI. Their hypothesis was that the League's lack of resource use in their territory was a product not of their swift destruction, but their differing state of technology. It was plausible that they had the means to travel the hyperlanes, or even the means to establish interstellar gateways, but did not possess understanding of the physics behind it all. That is to say, that the members of the League were primitive, in a sense, and had simply stumbled upon some prior technology that brought them to the stars in a very blinkered state. The optimism part was that while they had clearly been destroyed somewhere along the way, their destruction was both a not an immediate reaction to their activity, and slash or b only the result of their limited engineering capacity. Of course, the SI was placed in contrast to this, and what better case in point was needed than the Amoeba War? A combination of curiosity, ingenuity, tenacity and technological sophistication had together saved Earth from a deadly fate which had bested at least one other planet somewhere out there. The damage patterns on First League relics were not consistent with the Amoeba's attacks, but whatever had taken them out, perhaps the SI could stop it. Or, even better, perhaps it simply no longer existed two million years down the line. At the close of 2221, 
a candidate for the First League destroyers, emerged. Pier Meiji had travelled all year through the hyperlanes, beyond the old First League borders, reaching the southeastern edge of the galaxy. There she had been greeted by one great voice, a voice that went from garbled sounds to perfect Japanese in just a few minutes. It was the voice of the Oned Karak Collective, to transliterate the crackling title it gave itself. It was a hive-minded super-organism, meaning that while Meiji was looking at a video image of a creature that resembled a very tall hedgehog, this was merely an organ of a greater being, which could only be comprehended when all of the Oned Karak were considered as a whole, just as the work of an ant means nothing without knowing its hive. This superorganism was keenly collecting star systems in its corner of the galaxy, and it had no hesitation to share its reasoning. It was securing resources so that it might expand its hive further. It was doing what the SI was doing, in other words, but not because of frivolously applied pressure from a subject population, but because there was no other option thinkable to the hive. The representative spoke of itself in the singular, and denied that there was any sort of leader in their collective. They were of one consciousness, and did not recognize the distinction between different individuals of their species, and individuals is certainly not the correct term, but humans simply did not have a correct term to use here. Despite the complexity of their internal affairs, outwardly the Oneg Karak were clear and simple to understand. They informed Meiji that should humanity ever possess resources that the Collective wanted, the Collective would take them. It was the most matter-of-fact threat one could receive. They were, thankfully, somewhat far away from humanity as it stood. But if they had worked out that humanity was earmarking resources as well, and they probably had given the speed at which they translated human languages, then it was likely that this would give the Collective a wake-up call. With this in mind, the SI began a diplomatic program to try and convince the Hive of the value in leaving humans alone. This was to be value in a purely practical sense. Over the coming years, the Collective would come to understand that there was a threat of unknown forces coming to destroy life. In this, they were far more ready to be paranoid than even the humans. The SI proposed that the humans be allowed to die first in such an event, in order to supply useful data on the nature of such a threat. This was precisely the argument the Collective was looking for, and they eventually expressed a sort of austere respect for humanity, promising to help them prepare for their useful deaths. It was good that the Collective tended to treat humanity as a Collective as well, speaking as if the humans they were talking to were volunteering to die personally. Dying for the Hive was a favourite pastime of the Oned Karak, so they enjoyed these interactions immensely. The SI personnel involved did not, but such was inter-intelligence diplomacy. Back in Seoul, at the close of 2222, the SI moved to interrupt the regeneration of the deadly amoebas. Their lost combat ships had eventually been guided back into the hyperlane system and been refit at the Murphid staging post. There they were joined by six newly built interstellar corvettes, forming the official sustainability initiative Space Navy. This force arrived in Seoul ready for battle, but a finishing touch was required. On Earth, people remained relatively terrified of the amoeba presence, and it had become known that the SI had poured all of their stored resources into the construction of these new ships. If they failed, they would be out of options for another year at a minimum. This almost allowed a vote of no confidence in First Peer Torres to reach the final stages. In reaction, she picked out one of the logistics overseers behind the new Corvette project and shuttled them from the Titan mining zone to join the fleet. This was Jesse Quinn, named Admiral of the Solar System. She was stowed into the cargo hold of one of the Corvettes, for they had no living quarters, and from there she was to command the fleet. This was an easy job, the ship computers had seen enough simulations to give them more experience than any human, but with Quinn there among the ships, the SI were making a show of confidence and giving the cowering onlookers someone to rally behind. The attack went ahead. 
the new corvettes, designed and built for battle alone, tore through the amoebas with lasers twice as potent as the earlier models. They could only be fired a handful of times before the mountings melted, but that was enough. The beams cut the amoebas open, sliced off their fins and tails, and ignited the blue fire incendiary fluid inside them. The amoebas were silenced with a single pass. The celebrations on Earth were unmatched. This was proof of a long-held contention that humanity could do anything. They had overcome some unknown horror of deep space and made it look easy. Of course, they, humanity, had done nothing but allow the SI to carry on with their plans, but now it was the humans willing to consider the species a collective for the purposes of gaining credit in this grand achievement. It was a moment of triumph for SI public relations, but they had a problem. The whole affair had proven that humanity's interest in terrestrial matters was very much tied to the threat the terrestrial posed. In the SI, it was always said that getting people to understand the real world was the key to gaining the mandate they needed to fulfill their mission, to keep humanity alive forever. But at the same time, the mental well-being of their wards had been severely affected by the Blue Fire attacks, and all the further threats one could imagine lay in wait in the stars. Therefore, to some extent, there was great benefit in telling everyone how the Oned Karak Collective was planning to swallow them up into an all-consuming hive mind, and to some extent, this should be kept a secret until the deed was being done, and then some quick scheme would have to avert the crisis, as had been the case in the War of the Worlds. There was no easy answer, and more to the point, there was no answer, because soon enough the next thing came along in the virtual, and the SI was trusted to have done the right thing. In 2223, when they released the latest report on galactic exploration, few felt the need to check it. One noted discovery was a graveyard of ships in deep space, just outside the space of the Uva Zivani. Pir Yushin describes two distinct First League fleets that had been in the Castaba system two million years ago. They were detectable now only via the dust still sailing around the system in the aftermath of their destruction, like the cosmic background radiation from the growth of the universe. That the metallic dust was of First League origin was only known because of the standard hull alloy composition found from previous debris. Some of the dust deviated from this, but that, presumably, was the dust of their opponents. The only strong takeaway was that even the supposedly peaceful and cooperative First League had been fighting wars and deploying member species as warriors against something. This pushed against the factions within the SI that argued they should not carry on flying their gunboats around in the aftermath of their victory. It wasn't clear what it would be yet, but there was military work to be done and the SI were bound by their founding axioms to carry it out. As things stood, both the Tuxcan Combine and the Oned Karak Collective had stated their willingness to destroy the human race, one out of malice, the other because they saw humans as just rather witty fertilizer. But relations with the Collective carried on improving into 2224, beyond the promise of just dying at a later time of greater convenience. The first sign of this was when Pier Meiji found something impossible. She was exploring the Celebri system on the edge of collective space, but was hailed from the surface of an icy planet by a human. This human claimed to be a member of the SI and spoke several languages, but had no name. Asked for identification, she said she was an exile. This was quickly seen for what it was a poorly hidden deception by the Collective. The Exile was asking to rejoin the SI and return to her old work exploring the galaxy, proving further that whoever made this facsimile, they didn't know what the SI primarily did. Meiji met with the Exile on board the SIS Zheng He, and was not immediately killed, which was the outcome the terrestrial gamblers were backing. The Exile proved to know quite a lot about science and its application, she was indeed very qualified to work for the SI. Whether she was to be accepted was put to a vote, 
and in her own defense, the exile recorded a long and poetic rant on the value of considering different beings within a species to be different individuals. The terrestrials watching loved it, and the exile was in. Getting an obvious spy under SI control had its uses. And furthermore, whatever she was reporting back to her masters and presumed creators in the collective, they seemed to like it. They started inviting SI scientists to come and visit their own worlds. Meiji promised to do it soon, and luckily the collective had little familiarity with lies. Instead, she carried on staking out the systems directly adjacent to their space. This was in service of a new SI goal, to cut off the advance of the collective and keep them as far from Earth as possible. There was a long string of hyperlanes that linked collective space to the SI's corner of the galaxy, and so by securing them all with military measures, the threat of the collective could be kept under control. This philosophy took the initiative into a decade of peace, in which the border of humanity's possessions was advanced closer and closer to the collective, all the while telling the exile that this was how it had forever been. It was a strange, quiet time, although this description only works in contrast to the bursts of discovery that came before and after it. Humans were no longer alone in the universe, but they still had no one to talk to, no one who was at all like them. But life as they knew it was on the way.